Kia ora everybody. This is Tūriki Delamere. It is Saturday, 14 August, and two or three hours time, the All Blacks are going to play Australia at Eden Park, and hopefully again win. Next week, Whakatohi is in the High Court down in Wellington, and I thought maybe it's an appropriate time to just give some reflection, at least on what I think the opening gambit should be for all um, Māori, iwi, hapu, um, treaty claimants, especially when it's involving land. Um, because the way the Crown has set up the process, um, the first thing we know about it, they've got a mandate at somebody and they come back with the Crown's offer. So if you take the treaty process to be like a, you know, say a field, at one end you've got the Crown, at the other end you've got iwi Māori, the first thing we know about is when the, our, our negotiators come back with the Crown's offer, which is down, down at the end of the field. And they certainly entitled to do their offer. But what I'm talking about is what should be the opening gambit for all iwi hapu claimants, which is put in writing and put out there to the to the tangata whenua, you know, the iwi, the hapu. So they know their claimants are going in with their starting point, okay? So today I'll give you also my opinion on the Crown's underlying objectives and the way they settle Treaty of Waitangi claims. And like I said, what should be the starting point? And then I'll give an update on, on Whakatohe. The underlying objectives come about, um, and my comments are based on my experience for three years, 1990-93, I was negoti negotiations manager for the Crown for Treat Waitangi Claims. 94-96, I was project manager, principal negotiator for Whakatohe Claim, the Raupatu Claim Y87. And then 96-99, I was a cabinet minister in the then coalition government. The tact the Crown uses is that your lead negotiators for the Crown tend to be Māori, like me. I was one. You know, the compassionate, knowledgeable, faithful Māori to, to talk about. Look, the reality is behind the scenes, it's all controlled by Pākehā. There ain't no compassion, no fairness, no justice. It's all about settling the claim at the lowest possible rate possible. Okay, and my background there, I think I have a bit of, bit of an idea. So if it was about fairness and justice. Then I say to the Crown, I say to Jacinda, and before that I said the same, John Key, Helen, Jenny, Jim. If you want to be fair and just, then use the same reasoning for the basis of um, why in 1998 the Crown reimbursed the investors in the failed Equity Corp um, debacle, $267 million. People who knowingly and willingly invested in the criminal Alan Hawkins and all went down the toilet. Oh, you poor people, let's give you back all your money because the Crown um, were tricked and fooled by Alan Hawkins as well. So the Crown decided, we'll take all the blame and we'll give all you mostly park investors your money back. Wow, we stated that for Māori and then fast forward another, what, 12 years, South Canterbury Finance, um, another fraud pyramid scheme, this time $1,600 million returned to the investors who no one twisted their arms, no one forced them into anything. They invested in another fraudster, but oh my God, let's give them their money back. Okay, you do that, why don't you do that for Māori for goodness sake? So, my starting point for all treaty claimants, and this is my message to um, Pokapo here, pre-settlement claims trust, I know you've gone down, you don't have a mandate yet, you know, certainly not with the tribunals approved, but the Crown's still dealing with you because, you know, you're all compliant and, you know, and you want to do what the Crown says, I guess. But anyway, the starting point should be, and should have been for Whakatō here and any other group, return every, to Māori, every square inch of land 
that is currently owned or controlled by the Crown, a Crown entity or local government entity. You stole it, give it all back. I don't give a toss that you decided, oh, how wonderful this stuff is. We've now called it the conservation estate. Yeah, whatever. It still comes back to us. And if you want us to keep it in that pristine state, and I'm pretty sure most Māori tribes will do that, you can pay for, for that as well. But we will own it. We will control it. And as people say, oh, but they won't do that. No, I'm sure they'll refuse. We all know that. And then we'll just sit there and demand, put it in writing. What is your reasoning for not returning what you stole? Because back to in 1993, I think it was, fiscal envelope, um, hui at Terere Marae in the Portiki, I dreamt up um, the, the stolen car. And so I'll use the example, can't remember who I picked on as the example. But let's say this is my grandpa Weihana, the fan of the Pokato here. He stole a car back in the 1920s, really flash car, belonged to Doug Graham's, you know, the right honorable Sir Douglas Arthur Montrose Graham belonged to his granddad. Anyway, my grandpa passed it on to my dad, Meruera uh, Tuariki, and I got my hands on it eventually when my father passed on. And then bloody Doug found out, Doug Graham found out, oh my God, that Delamere has got my granddad's car. So he goes, the cops, and I have to return it because that's what happens. You know, when stolen property is found later, the police come and knock on your door and say, hey, bro, you've got some stolen property. It has to go back to the original owner. And I agree with that. That's fair. That's common sense. That's justice. Unless it's Maori land that was stolen by the crown, it doesn't come back. We can't do that now. It's too late. Well, hell, I should have kept been able to keep Doug's car. It was too late. Okay, <laughs> so let's move on. I think I'd like to see the starting point, and this one will probably get good traction with the government anyway, whether it's Labour-led or national-led. Every marae in the country, I want the Crown to guarantee and ensure that every marae in, uh, in the country is hooked up with high-speed, high-bandwidth, internet. Um, and that's because, especially the rural marais like um, us down the coast, we struggle to keep connected uh, with the marae because it's very hard to get there. It takes five hours from Auckland to get down to Maitafanapunu marae at, at Fitianga Bay. But I think the government will probably support that. And here's another one I think is very, very important. We're doing the census now, and recent census, the last two, maybe three, there's a question, what iwi hapu do you belong? And you can pick pretty well as many as you want. Yeah. I want that information to go to the iwi hapu. So, um, but it's private, I agree. So therefore, there should be a question in the census. Do you agree that if you disclose the identity of your iwi and hapu, for those details, your details to go through to your mandated um, entity organization for your iwi and hapu. And I also want the Crown to work with Māori, develop a common national database that manages the contact details of Māori, all of us. Can you imagine 750,000, 800,000 Māori all on a single thing constructed database? Um, what do you have? You've got the Māori nation all wired up through the marais all wired up on a common database. Very, very powerful um, tool to be used. I can tell you what, the Troy, you know, that mongrel Troy Balker in Wellington, he'll certainly hate it. You know, those white supremacists, for God's sake, don't give Māori that sort of um, power of actually being united in any sort of way. But, you know, this is for you, Willie. Willie Jackson and all your cohorts there. Um, but Māori, especially those in Labour, but also the other parties, make it happen, bro. Put that question into the census, next census. It, ask us, do we want our details to go through and tell you what, I'll be saying yes for me and all my mokos and kids will do the same. All my whanau will do the same, pretty sure of that. And then use the influence you've got, Willie. I mean, you're doing it pretty pretty good at the moment, I think. Um, you know, your colleagues there, Nanaya and Penne and Calvin, you know, doing good work, but they're all too polite, those fellas. You, you're in your face, you know, a bit like me and Thoe Enari, I guess. So good on you, Willie. Make it happen, bro. Because once you've got the Māori Nation, hey, online, we're ready to rock and roll. 
like Marine, the Marine area. The Crown came back and convinced our negotiators to say, oh, this is a good idea. You guys claim somewhere in Ohiwa Harbor. You know, Ngati Ahua have an argument with us on that, no problem. And down the other end, by Tōrere. And then they say, we go out to, to Fakari, the White Island. And it says, what the hell are you guys doing saying that's our marine area? The marine area is at Ahiwa Harbour, Tōrere, straight out 200 bloody miles, because that's what our government claims to be our economic, exclusive economic zone. And it's great, no problem, 200 miles. But from 200 miles all the way back to um, our land point, that's ours. The land, the seabed belongs to us, the fishing rights belong to us, the mineral rights belong to us, and Fokuto here will determine what the recreational fishing rights will be. And I can tell you, for me anyway, personally, I will certainly be fighting like a dirty dog to make sure the fishing rights um, recreation are the same for Māori and Pākehā, the same for Whakatōhia and non So give you my word on that one. But we're in the driver's seat for that because those are our assets and I'm pretty sure the courts will agree. That's why the government probably won't want to go to court about it. And the last question here, what's a fair dollar quantum settlement for what you did to us? And Whakatōhia, you confiscated all of our land. You stole it. Then you had a cavalry go in there and charge down the Waiweka Valley, killing a whole bunch of our ancestors, our tipuna. So what's that worth? Well, I was in Greytown recently at the dentist and saw the Wairarapa Times Age and Ngāti Kuhunganuki Wairarapa had a quantum offer of $115 million. I think, we that's $15 million more than us in Whakatō here, but hold on, these fellows didn't have a raupatu. They didn't have a cavalry charge killing all and sundry. So how come they got more than us? Or well, maybe we need, need new negotiators, I don't know. But anyway, look, whatever the amount is that we eventually agree to, is what do we start with? Let's not wait for the Crown to put a number on the bloody table, for goodness sake. So here's some thoughts. Why don't we just say, Whatever the crown you've given the Royal Ballet and New Zealand Symphony Orchestra in the 21st century, so I've been generous, not forever, just the 21st century, we'll have that. And I'm pretty sure right now that's well over $200 million, maybe close to $300 million. So is Fokoto here who's had all their land stolen and a lot of their ancestors murdered by the British government, is that worth over 200, I reckon? Or at least worthy of what the ballet is and um, the orchestra is. Or what about, let's look at Equity Corp, 1998, escalated by an inflation to $67 million. I'll start with that, $267 million is probably six, 700 million these days. Of course, then we go to South Canterbury Finance, 2010, 11 years ago, $1,600 million. Well, shucks, let's start, that's a good basis. We'll start with there. And with inflation, I guess we're looking at $2.5 billion. And that's our starting point. Will we end up with that? I wish. But hey, you got to put the stake in the ground of where we start. Don't start with what those crown, those Maori crown agents from um, Tarawhiti come back to you with. We put our stake in the ground. Here's our stake. Make sure that everyone in the Iwi Hapu know about it. Publicize it, print it, and then tell the crown, justify it, and then ask the crown, now tell us why we're being unfair and unkind to you fellas. I mean, you're the, we're the victims here. We're the one who lost our land. We're the one who had our people killed um, and all sorts of things. We're the one who had our culture and language squashed. So put our starting point in. So those are my thoughts on the starting point. Um, here's the entry into Whakatō here coming down um, through the Bay of Plenty um, from Whakatāni, Tauranga. Um, and you know, this afternoon I started going back to what did I say back when I was in Parliament, you know, what things did I say? And I came up with some interesting things, and I'll actually quote them. This is the out of the Hansard, um, 13 July, and 
this is me speaking, and I'm going to do snippets of it. I will read all of you. And I quote from what I what says in Hansa, what I said. I listened to the corridor earlier from the Minister of Māori Affairs, the Honourable Tohenare, when he talked about how the Crown should return land it had taken. I noted that my colleague sitting in front of me, Sir Douglas Graham, interjected and said, we do. Oh, you do, Doug. Well, all I have to say to Sir Douglas Graham, speaking on behalf of the Whakapō here, is prove it. Some 80,000 to 90,000 hectares of land were taken from Whakapō here under Raupatu. The Crown has said that there's no land to give back, but, how, but the Crown still owns about 40,000 hectares. It's called the conservation estate, but it's still crown owned and crown controlled. And the crown has already acknowledged that the question of that land, the acquisition of that land was wrong and improper. I call it legalized theft. I know that Sir Douglas disagrees with my analysis, and but I and most Māori call it theft. The crown passed laws to justify it, but from time to time, the crown admits that land throughout this country, including that land at Whakatohia was wrongly taken. Now that's what I said, back in 1999. And moving on, then I went on and raving on. But where the Crown still owns or controls property, property that it took wrongly, I believe that there is a moral obligation on Parliament, no matter what parties are in control, whether it be national, labor, or any other combination thereof, to return that land. If land was wrongly taken from a park here in Remuera, we would return it. And I was brought up to understand that as a concept of the Westminster system of justice, that property that is stolen or wrongly taken is returned to the rightful owner. In the case of the conservation estate in Whakatohia, the rightful owners are the people of Whakatohia. Okay, moving on in my speech going towards the end, I quote again, we were talking about, um, I forget the name of the bill, it was before the select committees must have been Tauhena, this bill, but anyway, Quote from me again, we have the issue of the bill going to the Māori Affairs Committee. I share my colleagues' thoughts on that. I'm not sure of the worth of the bill going to the select committee because the agreement is cast in stone. But then again, as I said, we sometimes cannot trust the Crown. I remember seven years ago, so that would be 1992, Ngati Fakoe signed an agreement over the lands at Pukorua or Ruafata. An agreement was signed that certain lands would not be sold and that those lands that had been gifted would be returned. A week later, the Crown did sell that land. And when Ngati Whakauwe came back and said, quote, 10 days ago, we signed a solemn agreement with you, the Crown, but now you've sold the land. We want you to enforce that agreement. The Crown's response was, we're sorry. We did sign that agreement. But the sale agreement a week later takes precedence over the sacred agreement that you signed. And you wonder why Māori are suspicious and don't trust um, the Crown and the various versions thereof. I mean, and, and that was before Helen decided to steal our bloody force, foreshore and seabed. <clears throat> so those are my thoughts today, two hours before the All Blacks give um, the Aussies a bit of a hiding. And as I am want to do these days, uh, I like to close on COVID-19. This morning, um, my irascible mate from up north, Hone Harawera, um, shared a posting um, from Penny Dalton, the son of Ben Dalton. Penny and his Japanese wife and children live in Japan. And it was a wonderful, wonderful piece um from penne encouraging us all to get our vaccination shots and why we should and that was based on his experiences in japan and I encourage all of you um you know link link into my any of my pages there um hone a whole bunch of others it's a brilliantly well-written piece and for goodness sake far no don't listen to all those anti-vaxxers spouting out their false media driven hype and drivel it's real we're lucky i mean jacinta hasn't got everything right but the one thing she has got right is covid but we're getting complacent and covid d variant lambda variant whatever is undoubtedly going to hit us at some stage 
And we see what it's doing in Sydney at the moment. We saw what it's done in Fiji over the last six weeks. If it hits us and it gets out in the community, those who are unvaccinated have a very, very high risk of catching it and dying, going into hospital. You read stories all the time of especially Americans who've been anti-vaccination -vac activists. I'm not taking, putting that muck in my body. And all of a sudden you see them crying as they are dying of COVID-19 because they didn't take the virus. So anyway, that's my message today, people. I got my vaccines, um, both of them finished over two months ago. Um, grateful for that. Played the Māori card, you know, I'm an old Māori who's got all sorts of comorbidity, so we got that in my whānau, I'm grateful for it. Um, feel a lot more comfortable and it don't hurt, bro. So anyway, you all take care and go all blacks. Kākiri anō.